Okay, so part two here. We're still at the kidney bean. Again, as a recap, huge, at least to me, huge open field, super wet pond uphill that is either overflowing or whatever. Very saturated landscape. Bringing it into my landscape to distribute it. This will be a swale that goes onward that way up to another ridge that's lower than that initial valley entry point. The overflow for this can gently push into the pathway. So this will be to provision for periodic flood events. And it meanders through here. I have it meandering so that it can slow the water, let even more material fall out of solution. Eventually I'll have the gray bark dogwood and um, European buckthorn pollards that I've done in here. I'll cut those out entirely and set this to marshland context stuff, figure out what sort of species go in there. I'd love to see some pawpaws in here, some Carpathian walnuts on the lumpy spots. So that's the beauty part too, is as I shave this by hand with the shovel, each of those mucky, super rich, like shovelfuls of pure muck topsoil can get thrown onto my hugel mounds. So these are all prunings and layers of junk, you know, woodland junk and debris that I've been laying up. You can see I've got these little raised garden bed sketches all throughout. And as I shave this, I have a destination for it. Um, as opposed to if I was on a big excavator, I'd have to move huge bucketfuls that had some topsoil, some subsoil, all the tracks and rutting. So this, for what it's worth, what I show you today will be representative of about 15 hours total of really intense labor. Well, that's at least just the reshape. Overall, probably 150 to 200 hours of labor. But that's just labor, that's human labor. That's a shovel that's $12, $15, something like that, pruning saw, and a rake to clean up, and one human. And I run on water and food, um, as opposed to diesel or gas. So it feels like the economics are pretty good. And this, you know, to have systems like this, that uh, it's just tools that I already have around and I just chip away at it when the weather's right in the winter. It feels really good. Um, anyway, off subject here. This is where it gets hard to, <laughs> to really explain. Um, right, meandering overflow point can come through the landscape and hits the first larger pond. Now, large is in human scale large. This is maybe a few thousand gallons worth of water storage. Um, and I built it around this big grandma European buckthorn. The great great grandma of all of my nuisance buckthorn. I mean, this whole freaking forest is buckthorn, buckthorn, buckthorn. I'm slowly removing. But anyway, it's a nod to her power to have this thing, because the buckthorn begets muck soil and just adores the wet. It really seems to love it and hold back moisture with its super black fibrous root system. So it seemed like a natural good spot for one pond. And this is at the exact same level, it meanders through, as my kind of more formal zone one, zone two pond, as in permaculture scale of, you know, use, utility. Um, and this pond is one I talked about in another video. I'll have a link uh, that you can click on here. But this is part of the system. And so from that other video, that's probably helpful to see this in the actual context of how it works out. Um, this is a bunch of thousands of gallons. I really don't know. I'm guessing between two and 4,000 gallons. And this receives, you can see these hoses are from the water catchment from a summer structure, as well as the sauna kitchen thing for now, and as well as the drainage from the Cobb greenhouse um, space. And all that water is moving through this nursery on its way down to this pond. Overwhelmed with details yet? I don't know. <laughs> I'm guessing a ton of people have clicked on to like sneezing kittens off of this video by now, but for those of you that are geeked out on moving, storing, deflecting, and understanding water with hand tools as much as I am, you're probably enjoying yourself, and so I hope that the three of you on the internet are enjoying this. Anyway, uh, this whole thing, what I've worked on today, I'm really excited about, is 
this morning when I came out here, this was just all wet. I had messed up my, over, like the overflow for this was higher than this whole diffuse area, which I don't want necessarily underwater. So it's kind of like, all right, while the water table's so high, I need to provision for a cresting event so that this isn't just backing up and flooding up. It was flooding like into here. And so what I did is I started shaving again, getting information but from the water, like starting at the high point and shaving, seeing where the water wants to flow, shaving, 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 and basically cutting a tiny sliver, a release valve, if you will, more or less exactly on contour, more or less. Um, although there's some weird things that happen here. So I can make weird turns like this by just digging a little deeper and suggesting a route for it. But what this allows, and I'm really excited about the aesthetic of this too, is it allows for the, the water from the high point of the property. So this is the highest point over here where the structures are. So they can have not wet feet. They all overflow and drain down to that pond, which can hit the system and run off that way towards the north. But then when it pulses, it receives a pulse event of really high input and it's cresting, it can then come through this whole circuit and move through either saturated soil and onto lower points in the property, or if this is dry, it can move through here and rehydrate all of this landscape because it's just about level through this whole thing. This is a incredibly meandering swale, basically. A swale that is on contour with the crested point of my pond. So whenever that pond pulses, just poom, way too much water input too quick, it can hit this huge, huge system, fill this up, and as aggressively as it fills up, it can overflow and go down slope. If it fills up slowly, it can just infiltrate through this whole trench. But basically it makes my whole living zone, that space in there, flood proof because huge pulse events can either hit the other pond and start going north or can crest and come through here, which is critical uh, to have that say on the system. Here's the other part that gets really exciting. I've got pieces of shale and shingles and um, uh, marble tiles. I want to rehydrate from here back. I slide in a piece, this starts filling. I can cut an irrigation trench to send it over here, send it over there. Um, gives me incredibly fine grain control over release and flood events in the whole property. Piece of tile here, all right, everything backfills and then spreads to whatever is on level here. So I can flood irrigate this whole region all the way down the line, or I can pull them all out and release as much water as possible, leaving the pond full. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, but <laughs> I'm going to move through this part really quick. Well, you can see what's happening here. After I did that cut, it's this is the point at which the uh, soil is taking on water and it's absorbing it faster than it's receiving input. And eventually, once that hits a saturation point, the water can then crest and keep sliding down slope. Anyway, man, I'm almost at 20 minutes. It's crazy. Bear with me, I'm gonna rush through the last. This has to get redug and cleaned out. You can see the faint line. It will function in a really, really wet time. Now this goes Again, this isn't wet because we're not in flood flood condition. We're just dealing with a, a kind of peaked water event, but not like inundation, inundation. So what that tells me is that that input that's coming in from the field of however many gallons per minute, per second, whatever, it's not trumping the overall water storage capacity of this landscape. So this landscape is currently being rehydrated by their their basic flood field flood condition and rehydrating and then being able to release to the next level rehydrating releasing and it all has somewhere to go comes to here another sediment pond etc this is a little bit more stable now you can see frogs and things live in here some fish are in there 
and then this will be able to overflow to go back through swale systems. These are hugel mounds that I just made recently from some trees. So I cut down one, two, three Scots pine, one, two, three, four Scots pine in this area and brought all their tops and stumps, cut them up with a chainsaw and laid them out on contour. These will eventually be blueberry beds and that little pond will, I'll be able to block it and have it flood into channels in between these. So I'll dig the soil out and put it on top, finishing the hugel mounds, dig, 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 put it on top, and then that gives me control to send water through these as swales, right? And then water is also encouraged to come down and enter the mega hugel. You can see that this is like an overflow thing that just dead ends in the beginning of this huge, huge raised garden bed zone. So this will get transplanted into in the spring. All done with hand tools. It's doable, costs 20 bucks. And my time in the winter, if you could have a garden bed that is like 16 feet wide and four feet tall, filled ent almost entirely with organic matter. It's really ancient decomposing stuff. I don't know how many cubic yards of biomass are in here um, for the cost of a shovel and time, downtime in the winter spent wisely. Um, that'd be good to have. And it also comes with its own, as water enters into here, it can dump into this, fill up, crest and go down slope. I'm just realizing how freaking much there is to talk about with this. Um, this then goes to You can hear it's getting wet again. That little pond can overflow down through here. So we're not there yet. We haven't reached that saturation point in the landscape. All the while we're going down slope, but just ever so faintly. You can see where the water table lives here. It's expressing itself in yet another sediment catch. This is all Fuki and Colt's foot in here, like super wetland plants. This can overflow. There's all the fuki, flaccid fuki of the winter, waiting for spring. There's such a beautiful plant. Comes down through here. Now it starts getting very hard to see. Follows along. I'm having a feeling this is probably less interesting. A lot of people are probably clicking away for by now. I'm going to just describe the rest and be done with it. It comes down through here, goes past the studio, deals with overflow from the studio, keeps going down slope and eventually hits uh, a big, big dug thing, which I'll put a link to, hand dug pond thing I put, um, put up on YouTube maybe two years ago. And that's that, it finally flows out at the end. Um, there's a ton more of these sorts of little trench systems all over. Again, all of them can have a piece of shale or tile slip into the ground to resist water flow to back flood and irrigate. Um, all of it just takes time and a shovel and again I don't even need like I said I don't need the a-frame I don't need all that kind of craziness um, I don't need a, a laser level I just start shaving where the water table is highest and expressing it how I want so either shaving with the hope of seeing water move away from the stored water position shaving it so water goes back to it you know all of that determines whether it's level you know, on contour, if it's releasing, if it's distributing across a ridge, etc. Uh, one last thing, it's kind of a meandering tour as well, which from a selfish standpoint helps me document where things are at this current moment in the life. It's definitely getting into zone four, zone five, insofar as, I guess I don't have a zone five, zone four, as far as utilization, um, this area is pretty wild. But then, finally, we get to another very active part of the water system. That goes back all the way through the property to that pond that was over by the European buckthorn, a couple hundred yards over that way. And this one's running like crazy. 
can see it's all wet through here. This is gonna be some serious tree planting this spring from like the walkway over. So having this water through for irrigation would be really nice. It keeps running through through this absolutely crazy black capped raspberry patch. Keeps going along down through here. Down along past these bamboos. I'm excited to see those take over. And let's see. Still running down through this trench. And so this trench is basically it's exactly on the property line. This is the northern end of the property. And it runs down along here. This is a little bit less like finesse finesse around wanting to deflect water to other spaces, etc. And it finally tapered off. You would see water running through here if it was saturated enough. It looks like the ground is still absorbing water all the way back up into there in the profile. When that's saturated, it can then come through here, keep saturating, and going and going and going. You can see I've got to renovate the weeds in here. And it'll come down. And I promise we're coming to the last part of the water system for this property. If you're still winning, still watching, then you win. <laughs> and that you've stuck through with the whole, oh wow, it happened. Okay, so yesterday, this was empty. That's crazy. And it's true. Yesterday morning, I looked at this, uh, this hole in the ground, so to speak, and it was completely empty. It is completely full, nearing ready to be overflowing. And it doesn't have water coming into it just now. This is where, I guess, the, the water that's coming down through here is expressing itself into this released space. The beauty part with this is that final zone here is it overflows and leaves the property. That's when water leaves here. Before any water can leave this property, it has to, after all that traveling, all that resistance, all that, that time to infiltrate into the soil and recharge the aquifer, recharge the water system, if it can't get through there and it's still in a surface flowing state, it enters this pond and by the time it gets all the way to the other side, it's slowed down enough that whatever solids load it might possibly have in it has hopefully fallen out of solution. And so this becomes a nutrient sink and a water source for my nursery. So it's a fun system and the overflows from that can come back over to here. Um, Final note here, this was done entirely by somebody with no formal training on, you know, like water engineering or any of that kind of stuff. This is all just empirical. You do a little watch the feedback, do a little watch the feedback, um, respond to feedback positively as a permaculture principle. Um, and over years, I mean, I've been shaving at this stuff off and on during thaw points for like three or four years now, and it's finally coming together. I'm sure there's still tons of work to do with this, but it's exciting to have water move meaningfully through the landscape, pause meaningfully in places where I want it to, and have nutrients retained on the property. Um, thanks for watching an insanely long video. It's the longest thing I've ever done, but um, I thought it was fun to share. And that's not even the, whole, the entirety of it. The whole south end of the property I didn't talk about. I'm not going to, I promise. <laughs> Thank you for watching, if you did. And have a good winter. Get out there with a shovel and start moving water around. Why not?